Spanish colonies. Sure. The U.S. early craze for conservation uh, was not entirely different from this process. This, I would say, as I said before, in my work, emptying the wilderness. Conservation is a matter of classification predicated on different processes of qualification and disqualification. I am borrowing the notion of classification from Tilde Siglev's paper, but I view it as a leading thread for the three presentations that are strongly linked in my view. So uh, I would like to introduce first the first speaker from the beautiful University of Coimbra in Portugal, Mariana Riquito. She is a candidate in political science at the Institute for Social Science Research of the University of Amsterdam, the Netherlands, and a junior researcher at the Center for Social Studies at the University of Coimbra, Portugal. She is a research member of the EU-funded Cost Action Traces as Research Agenda for Climate Change, Technology Studies, and Social Justice. Mariana also BA degrees from and a master's degrees in international relations from the Faculty of Economics of the University of Coimbra and a master's degree in sociology and political sciences from Sciences Po Bordeaux, France. Her current research interests include debates around the so-called Anthropocene, political ecology, green extractivism, and prefigurative politics. Mariana, the floor is yours, and we will uh, um, uh, uh, flash you a five minutes uh, signal uh, when it's time. You have the floor. Okay, hello everyone. <laughs> I think you can hear me now. Yeah. Um, yes, okay, perfect. Uh, thank you so much for your uh, kind introduction. Uh, yes, my name is Mariana Riquito and I have just recently started my PhD at the University of Amsterdam. I'm sorry I cannot be there in person today. I unfortunately had a bike accident living in Amsterdam, so uh, I have to stay home for, for a while now, but uh, it's a pleasure to still attend virtually. And today I will be speaking about this beautiful mountainous region that you can see on this picture here, which is, lays in the northern part of Portugal in the Barroso region. And the title of this presentation, which is co-authored uh, with a research colleague, Professor Alexander Dunlap, based at the University of Oslo, is Enforcing Green Extractivism, Social Warfare, and the Making of the Critical Raw Material Frontier in Portugal. So before I get to uh, the get specifically into the, the field work that we have conducted and some of our preliminary findings, uh, I would like to start off by uh, yes, uh, taking a critical take on uh, look on the European Green Deal and introducing the notions that will guide me through my presentation, such as green extractivism, green sacrifice zones and others. Uh, as you probably know, uh, in December 2019, the European Commission has announced its new growth strategy, the European Green Deal, which aims to transform the European Union into a fair and prosperous society with a modern and competitive economy, all the while reaching carbon neutrality by uh, 2050. So we're uh, almost, almost there, even if it looks uh, far away. And one of the main sectors that is targeted by this energy transition is the transportation sector. Uh, that is because the transportation sector is one of the main uh, polluters. Uh, for you to have an idea, in 2017, uh, almost 30% of the greenhouse, greenhouse uh, has emissions uh, across the 28 member states uh, were uh, emitted by the, the transports. And so as part of the Green Deal, the European Commission aims to scale up the use and the production of electric vehicles from 1.8 million to 30 million by 2030. So in the next eight years, ensuring that by 2050, nearly all cars will be zero emission. 
And so the demand for minerals that are needed to produce uh, batteries for electric vehicles, especially lithium, has already skyrocketed. Uh, in September 2020, uh, the European Commission's vice president has announced that the European Union would need 18 times more lithium by 2030 and 60 times more by 2050. The EU is currently importing 86% of its lithium, with 66% coming slowly from Chile. And so um, to ensure uh, that the resource self-sufficient goals are met by 2050, the EU has begun uh, legislative and administrative efforts to ensure uh, that it meets these self-sufficient goals. Uh, for you to have an idea, in 2017, the European Commission and the European Investment Bank have launched the European Battery Alliance, which aims at establishing precisely a domestic battery value chain. Um, as part of the European Battery Alliance's strategic action plan, the European Raw Material Alliances has been created in 2020. And uh, in September 2020, that same month, uh, lithium was added for the first time to the list of critical raw materials. So uh, lithium has really become uh, the new oil, uh, with some calling it the white gold. Um, and this is really part of ensuring uh, that the EU reduces its material dependency or energy insecurity. And as you probably uh, also know, the context of the current war and the, the increased sense of energy insecurity it has brought will most likely accelerate all these efforts. So really, we're talking about very recent policy changing frameworks. And I do believe that this changing policy framework will be accelerated even more in the, uh, the next months. Lithium is truly now conceived as a strategic element for preserving the European energy sovereignty, and therefore it is understood as a security priority. But really, where I position myself and what some critical scholars have been denouncing is how the European Green Deal and all the adjacent legislation around climate mitigation strategies are particularly emblematic examples of how capitalist eco-modernization under the pretext of combating climate change has been justifying and intensifying extractive practices. Really, the extraction of lithium and of other critical energy materials, uh, namely cobalt or copper, is constructed as an urgent need to meet the challenges of the climate crisis, despite and regardless of all its well-documented and extensive uh, socio, uh, ecological, human and political consequences. The proposed rapid and extensive de deployment of low carbon infrastructures and other renewable technologies uh, really ignores the extreme extractive land use and reality behind them. And so the emerging conflicts uh, around the implementation of the green economy projects or the green energy transition projects um, point to the importance uh, has some uh, scholars like my research colleague Alexander Dunlap, but also Judith Shapiro or John Andrew McNeish have been, have been highlighting the, the emerging conflicts around um, the new so-called green economy point to the importance of critically examining this European Green Deal, exploring how it might function as a strategy for capital accumulation, further commodification of nature of non-human populations and dispossession of rural livelihoods. So really, in this presentation, I will be focusing on the making of this new green extractive frontier in Portugal. Um, Portugal is estimated to have Europe's largest lithium reserves, uh, and it ranks eighth place uh, in the world in, in terms of um, known reserves of lithium and other materials. Uh, the northern region of, of the country is particularly rich in um, not just lithium, but other energy uh, mater uh, materials such as copper or nickel. Uh, and the country is already the EU's largest uh, producer of lithium. Uh, in 2019, the country was responsible for 
had a share of 1.6% of the total global uh, production. However, the Portuguese lithium is extraction was never targeted towards electromobility, but rather uh, to the indus industries of ceramics and glassware. But the Portuguese government really sees the current energy transition uh, as an opportunity to uh, put the country in a position of leadership within the EU. And uh, for the past five years, it has signed uh, and allowed contracts either for exploration or for research and prospecting of minerals across 25% of its continental mass. But really the Northern region of Bajoso that you can see on red in the map to your right uh, is really the new neuralgic point of this lithium mining rush. And Covas do Bajoso, which is a very small village uh, composed of less than 300 inhabitants. It's really the epicenter of this lithium mining rush. This is where uh, the British multinational Savannah Resources uh, wants to open what would potentially be the EU's largest open pit lithium mine. Uh, this map here is a map uh, sh proposed by Savannah Resources of the proposed, proposed mining project. As you can see, the idea is to open four large mines um, and all the adjacent necessary infrastructures to um, yeah, uh, 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 leave the, the materials uh, and the total area that they, they want to, to, to occupy is 594 hectares, so almost 600 hectares. Uh, this is a photo taken by the, from the sky uh, of um, uh, the prospection service that they have done a couple of years ago and you can still see the, the devastation that, that it has led. Um, and just to give you a, a small, a very brief context of the socio-ecological profile of this, of this village, um, Covas do Barroso is an agricultural village uh, dominated by livestock production and crops that are very typical from mountainous uh, regions. Uh, and animal production is really the basis um, of this town's agrarian economy, dominated by Specific, uh, uh, predominantly by uh, breeding of cattle for beef, because um, they still have uh, uh, an indigenous uh, species of beef. Um, it is mainly composed of small holdings uh, of cattle, but also sheep, goat, and pig farming. And all of these contribute significantly to household economies and plays an important social role. Uh, so in this town, um, this town still maintains a rural subsistence economy with very few per, per surpluses and most importantly, very low consumption levels when compared to the rest of the country or to the rest of other European regions really. And the locals preserve to this day ancestral methods of uh, treating the land and treating the animals. And for this in 2017, this was the first Portuguese village to be classified by FAO, the, um, Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations has a world agricultural heritage, uh, recognizing the authenticity of the territory, the traditional ways of working the land and the communitarism of its inhabitants. So really in this town, uh, communal culture and communitarian culture is also a very important aspect of its identity. Uh, in the Northern regions of Portugal and in Galicia, uh, there is a, a very uh, specific uh, kind of property uh, and way of owning the land. So the land is communally owned and communally managed. Uh, so this is also is very interesting to see how this develops in conflict with the mining industry's interests. And so truly the lands here are communally owned. They're known as Baldius. And all the rest of the traditional ways of working the lands, they are also communally um, communally managed. So there is the water distribution system, for example, which is uh, called Tornadag, which is the shift, the sharing of the water. Um, so really just uh, just to give you this, the socio-ecological profile of this village. And so given this communitarian and agrarian identity of this very small town, uh, the social and ecological impacts of the proposed mine are, are extensive. Uh, leading the, all the locals uh, and some environmental activists to reject this project. In the sense, uh, in, um, in, in my opinion, and in what some other uh, scholars have been theorizing, um, not necessarily in coverage, but in other current mining conflicts, 
this town really perfectly encapsulates and illustrates the paradoxes of the current energy transition. This village, as you can see, of uh, very pristine uh, uh, beauty and nature is now being transformed into a green sacrifice zone. This term was coined by uh, Christo Zografos and Paul Robbins, uh, and it comes uh, and is developed after the theorization of the concept of sacrifice zones, which tell us that these are places that in the name, in the sake of capital accumulation and in the sake of bringing about progress, modernization, industrialization, some territories must have to be poisoned, I mean, or can be poisoned, gutted, impoverished in the, in the name of this capital accumulation. So this is mainly theorized within the, within the Latin American concept, of course, where extractivism um, has shown its more grim um, consequences. Uh, but now these two authors have coined the term grim sacrifice zone uh, to explain that in the context of the green economy and of the climate change discourse, some geographies, some territories, such as Covas do Barroso that you see in the picture here, um, are being sacrificed, are being plundered, exploited, destructed in the name of combating climate change. So over the past five years, uh, the locals have been fighting actively to protect and preserve nature and their livelihoods. Uh, but in the face of reiterated resistance, what we have been seeing is that the European Union has implemented measures uh, to assure that its citizens don't actually have the right to reject these projects. In September 2020, the president of the European Raw Materials Alliance, so the, the alliance that has been created, uh, has part of the strategic action plan uh, for ensuring domestic, a domestic value chain of batteries. The president, when asked about the what to do to avoid the possibility of big territorial oppositions to these projects has replied with the need to implement the social license to operate, which basically means giving out money or other measures, financial measures or social measures to pay off the population. Uh, in 2017, the European Commission has created MIRU, uh, which means the MIRU project, um, which stands for mining and metallurgic regions of the EU, whose aim is precisely to develop uh, the social license to operate guidelines at the EU level. And the MIRU project, the mining companies and the European Union uh, institutions have been working hard to ensure uh, that the mining industry, the mining companies get this social license to operate. So what I will, try to show now, these are still preliminary findings, but it's really about how the mining, uh, these specific mining companies, Savannah Resources, in cooperation more or less direct with state authorities uh, has been uh, doing and um, yeah, efforts to in engineer the social acceptance of extraction. So here um, I also, uh, expand and get inspiration from um, scholars who have been theorizing about extractivism has uh, not just the material practices that sustain extraction, but also has the ideology behind it. And when we think about it this way, as Marcus Kruger um, suggests, we can understand that extractivism needs not only a very strong physical en engineering, so the, the technologies, the minds, the, but also social engineer, that, that is prior to uh, this physical extraction. And so um, in this presentation, what I hope to now show in the last minutes is some preliminary findings about this, these efforts to engineer the social acceptance of extraction. Uh, this uh, relies on ethnographic fieldwork that I have conducted with the anthropologist Alexander Dunlap in January 22. Uh, but prior to this fieldwork, since uh, about May last year, I have been a very active participant and I've been going back and forth to the Bajoso region. And now I, I hope to be developing uh, this case study further on in my uh, PhD dissertation. And so uh, what we have noticed is the first effort is really the creation of this lexicon, which I have already briefly mentioned. Uh, the political and industrial elites have been equating mining with renewable technologies, and this is why they have coined the term green mining, the first 
conference on green mining actually took place last year in Portugal while we were held in the presidents of the EU Council. And this is intended at disarming anyone who argues um, otherwise or who expresses concerns about the toxic and devastating consequences of mining. On top of coining extractivism and labeling it as green, the concept of critical materials is always associated with this new emerging um, industry. Um, this concept, as Theo Rio Frankos recalls, actually has its origins in the military complex and is now being recycled for the green economy. And critical here means that it's imperative, it's categorical, it's necessary. And so this rhetoric of inevitability basically makes it impossible for populations to question the decisions made by governments. Uh, this is an urgent necessity. It is being portrayed as an urgent necessity, despite its well-documented consequences. So one could even say this is sort of the green version of Tina. There is no other alternative. Then a second thing that the mining companies have do, and this is more or less in direct, direct cooperation with state authorities in Portugal, is that they make use of legal norms that uh, change over the, over the course of the time, uh, and they make use of bureaucratic mechanisms, which are there to assure that there is a facet of public participation, but, in, in, but truly the citizens are denied their actual, actual rights uh, to, the, uh, to participation. So uh, in this case, for you to have, for you, just to briefly explain, uh, the, the Portuguese state has signed more than uh, 12 years ago, a contract with another company uh, for other minerals and for only an area of 70 hectares. But then without consulting the local um, authorities or consulting the local communities, it has added an addendum to the contract that has extended the mining area and has sold this contract to Savannah Resources. So basically without any prior consultation, the state has enlarged to up to almost 600 hectares uh, something that at the beginning was only 70 hectares, not for lithium, but for quartz and feldspar. Um, and this is why the parish council of this village has already filed a suit against the Portuguese state, contesting the way this contract, contractual transfer was made. And the Portuguese Environmental Agency is also under invest, currently under investigation by the Hours Convention, uh, which is basically a convention um, that ensures access uh, to in, uh, environmental uh, information, environmental <coughs> matters. Um, and uh, the Portuguese Environmental Agency is currently under investigation because of its refusal uh, to uh, give access to documents of the environmental impact assessment. Um, the locals also report having concerns about the company's real uh, capabilities of conducting a so-called green mining project since Savannah Resources doesn't have any mining record. It is actually a stock exchange company. Uh, I see I'm getting, yes, one minute left. So, um, and uh, the environmental impact assessment was also done without having access to the field. So all of these bureaucratic procedures basically, um, yeah, uh, they are questionable or they're under investigation. And we can argue that this constitutes a form of bureaucratic violence that contributes to excluding communities from the participation processes. And then uh, just to quickly finalize, the company is also trying to establish good relations within the community. They have installed a permanent info point, as you can see in the photo. They send out newsletters every trimester. They do a control of the media where they pay to put propaganda on local media, on the local radio and local newspaper. Uh, they also distribute pamphlets asking workers for their minds, even though the environmental impact assessment was not yet, uh, is not yet, has not yet been approved. So all these are tools of persuasion and manipulation, or if you'd like, of social, social engineering to discipline uh, the populations and to, tame, to manufacture the consent around this project. Finally, they are also um, really infiltrating the rural social bonds. They're approaching more vulnerable people. They're offering material support. They're threatening with expropriation if people don't sell their lands. They're buying their lands at much higher prices. They're using a lease format, so giving half the money now and then saying that they can get the half uh, the money uh, back 
uh, if the project goes forward or get their lands if the project does not go forward. So presenting this as a win-win uh, win -win situation. Um, so really uh, all these social engineering um, uh, strategies are aimed at dividing the population. As a local woman told us, uh, people are in spades with each other. This is just war, it's just war. So here we make use of the concept of social warfare and I'm really finishing, um, which we borrow from Foucauldian theory. And um, to explain that really all these social engineering strategies are perpetuating a very slow but insidious social war warfare. Uh, this war obviously takes place in a very unequal arena. On the one side, we have local communities who have are extremely vulnerable and have been left out by the centralized government for decades. And on the other side, there is a myriad of very powerful actors who more or less work together to legitimize highly extractivist projects. The European Union, the Portuguese government, the mining companies, part of the press, part of the academic institutions have been creating the conditions for the social acceptability of extractivism. It is this vast financial, economic, uh, uh, technological, scientific, political complex that allows the reproduction and expansion of the capitalist world, world order. The dark webs that link political, mining and academic institutions, the multiple obstacles that are placed in front of citizens' participation, the operations of psychological division, the promises of jobs and economic development, all of these mechanisms serve to manufacture a consensus around the solutions of green capitalism and make both people and resources governable and extractable. So sorry for uh, all this time and thank you for listening. I'm coming to questions. Thank you very much, Mariana. I will, I will keep two things for the further discussion. The first one is the concept of sacrifice, which seems to me very relevant and very important for the, the discussion. And the second point, you mentioned Savannah as a stock exchange company uh, that is directly mining. I would call it finance mining. But uh, as far as I, we can tell from this morning, I hope you attended, uh, Rio Tinto is not that different from Savannah and the connection between early finance and mining is, is clear. So thank you again. And now we move to the second presenter today, Sonali Yadav. No. Yes. Uh, good afternoon. Good, good afternoon or good evening, Sonali. Yeah, good Can afternoon. Can you hear us? OK, yeah. so Emma, let me. Yeah. yeah. Very good. Welcome. Um, OK, I, I will introduce you very briefly. You are uh, in your final year of PhD, if I'm not mistaken, at the Center for the Study of Regional Development at Nehru University in Delhi, New Delhi. And you are looking forward to participating in this conference as, I quote you, a young motivated researcher working on political ecology of conservation and land grab. And you have been working in the Central Indian Forest for the last six years, and you are engaging with the larger paradigm of conservation. So, Sonali, you have the floor. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, this is, I think it's 6.30 uh, p.m. in Nedwari. So good evening, audience. And I hope I am audible. Yeah? Uh, oh, all right. Okay. okay. Uh, before uh, before I start with my uh, presentation today, I would just like to uh, briefly introduce the contextual framework of my study. So uh, here I go. Conservation induced displacement and livelihood options of displaced communities are the most contested issue in the conservation paradigm. Protected areas based on fortress model of conservation came into the existence and a network of national parks, wildlife sanctuaries, and tiger reserves have came to existence. The fortress model of conservation is based on two Western axioms of hands-off nature and no human interference. This is an exclusionary approach that led to the eviction of millions of indigenous people from their native land and their alienation from the land and the source of their livelihood. 
The process over time became regressive toward these communities and conservation induced displacement became a monster for these communities. Indian, Indian conservation story took currency after passing of Wildlife Protection Act of 1972 and a milestone development under the name of Project Tiger has changed the face of Indian ecological history drastically for coming years. The fortress model of conservation, which was adapted in India for conservation, was questioned on its adequacy in late 90s. The model has been successful in the protection of wildlife population of tigers, which has increased like twofold. However, the model failed to address the problems of giving a secured livelihood option to the relocated population. The incidences of poverty, malnutrition, misery became a norm among people after relocation. Central Indian forests have been the abode of indigenous people and is one of the richest tribal belts in the world. The tribal communities living in these semi-arid tropical forests are dependent on forests for their livelihood options, and they have a strong emotional affiliation with these forests. The land alienation of tribes living in Madhya Pradesh, where my case study is based, after declaring nearly 40% of total geographical area as a PA protected area, created existential crisis for these communities. The massive relocation took place in the last seven decades after independence. The relocation from homeland have been opposed in the first phase and first decades of the relocation. There have been conflicts over land and land rights, which has resulted in extreme violence in the hilly tracts of central India, claiming their lives and livelihoods. The relocation packages and compensations have not ensured the, even the basic amenities to these deprived communities. Their livelihood options are not even secured and they are fooled by false promises. In this backdrop, I would like to open my presentation and here I go. So, so the Western model of conservation based on two exams of hands off nature and magnetism has become a major approach and this approach is paradigmatic in the Indian story of conservation induced displacement and displacement of indigenous communities. I have taken Forest Policy Act from 1875 till present date to understand the, in, the larger paradigm of conservation in Central Indian forest and under the flagship program of Project Tiger. And then I will narrate the present situation, especially with special reference to Madhya Pradesh, which is my case study, and how I have uh, basically working with these communities. And now what are my major findings? I'll share them. The political ecology of conservation, as we understand, defines the environment as an arena where different social actors have asymmetrical power, and I am borrowing it from Byron and Bailey. Therefore, conservation policy is paradigmatic in its example. Competition for environmental control, protected areas by definition, establishes jurisdiction and broadens the definition of exclusionary rights. Connection between ecology and social context by matching ecological and social chronologies, contributing to the new production of new spaces, which are now if, if, we, if we try to understand, they are basically these new spaces of extractivism. Idealization of nature, hands of nature, production of nature and production of spaces. And I have also borrowed the concept of Neil Smith where he has specially talked about how nature is produced as a pristine commodity which can be protected one, on one hand and becomes a new mode of accumulation of land and resources. So if we try to understand the wildlife conservation and its impact, we really have to look into basically from where it started. And as in the beginning of this session, it has already been discussed that it's a colonial concept. And then the foundation of Yellowstone National Park can be seen as you know watershed kind of incident in 1872, where protected areas came into existence for endangered species and for overall protection of environment. It followed territorial mode of conservation and approaches where the fortress approach, which talks about hands off nature has been widely adapted in all those countries which were under the impact of colonial regime for some, for some point of time. 
now focusing on my field work my work which uh, which i did in central indian forest i i would like to narrate uh, the conservation induced displacement as indian story conservation models and approaches in india are heavily imprinted on the western model of conservation especially the fortress approach or we can call it exclusionary approach it excludes the people who are actually there who are the indigenous uh, people of that particular region in colonial india where the first modern protected area was established in 1930 heli national park since then there has been we can see that the this booming number of protected areas 657 pas 530 plus more wildlife sanctuaries and more than 50 reserve parks were created they cover overall 5% of total geographical area of country and according to an estimate this plan is now to double the area in next 50 years the upcoming chain of wildlife conservation projects and national parks after the independence in 1947 was a grand and welcoming ex expectation the first indian board of for wildlife conservation was established in 1952 and then from there 1970 uh, to a landmark in the ecological and environmental history of this country came under the name of wildlife protection act of 1972 soon after one year project tiger initiative was taken in 1973 so this is how we see a series of changes that took place in the uh, in in the backdrop of the conservation history of indian subcontinent now uh, because since uh, i am almost on the uh, you know completion of this work so i would like to Uh, share some of the major objectives of uh, the study so the first the objective was to understand and interrogate the process of extraction through conservation also to map the nature of accumulation from colonial to post colonial india within three phases 1950 1970 1970 to 1990 and from 1990 till present day my study area is kanha national park it is one of the biggest national parks in india situated in madhya pradesh and uh, we will see uh, how kanha national park has become a major site of contestation of spaces and it has become a major site of the process of extraction so therefore the third objective of my work is to understand the forms of geographies of extraction in the process of conservation now i have based my work and uh, this is my methodology and my data source that includes the study is based on primary survey which i kept on doing going there and coming back and then understanding trying to understand and engaging uh, in the field and it is a kind of ethnographic survey for the sample villages critical analysis of available literature including archival data whatever whatever uh, data we you know it's very difficult to extract this kind of data since archives and everything is now under the control of government and then ethnographic survey plus a brief profile of the study area which i have also included in this presentation for all of you so this is the map this is the larger map of madhya pradesh and interestingly uh, i would like uh, my audience to see that there are n number of existing wildlife sanctuaries national parks and uh, there is this entire uh, domain of madhya pradesh which is dominated by these kind of conservation sites and later on they have become conservation uh, basically corridors say for example this is my study area kanha this is page they are all national parks bandhavgarh so there is a huge corridor which runs from here to there interestingly and coincidentally this is a re this is the region which is dominated by most of the tribal population and it is very easy because because it is very easy to dominate it is very easy to evict them out therefore uh, the extraction has multi layered here it is not only the extraction of forests and resources it is also the deprivation from uh, deprivation of people from their source of life their livelihood and their social capital now uh, focusing on my study area so uh, if we see this is madhya pradesh and uh, Uh, if 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 i would like to uh, you know showcase so these are the villages uh, which i study uh, these this is the buffer zone of kanha national park this is mandala district and uh, i have surveyed 
as far as I could, uh, as far as as a researcher, I have the limitations. Uh, I, I cannot go beyond the point inside forest, and I cannot cover as much as I wish to. But but still, I try to uh, I try to uh, survey these villages, Kisli Kana, which was originally the site of relocation. Uh, initially, the tribal population was re, uh, was located here, and in, and then they and then they were shifted to these this margin of this. Uh, entire forest area. Then I surveyed this village and this one also. And therefore, I tried to cover five six village from this uh, side of uh, Mandala. And this is the buffer zone of Kana National Park. And uh, now, so why I have chosen Kanha? Uh, because uh, Kanha National Park uh, is situated in Madhya Pradesh and it was inaugurated as the first protected area in Central Indian forest. And it's a classic example of eviction of primitive Bagar tribes from the Banjar Valley region in 1973. The interference of humans has been restricted inside this protected area and nearly three to four million people living inside these PAs and on the margins are displaced. However, data, whatever data is available uh, with newspapers and what people report is actually not uh, very clear. But uh, if, if, if if going by an estimate, these relocations actually talk about more than five you know, million people being relocated. The Wildlife Protection Act in India is a great divide in terms of displacement, and it has changed the face of ecological history, where displacement has become a norm. And certain classifications, you know, like it, is it a voluntary displacement or it's a force or involuntary? Uh, I don't think there is any kind of typology for such displacements exist because uh, uh, because uh, the bagger tribes, especially uh, the tribes where I surveyed, uh, they do not have this kind of option to choose whether you want to shift or you do not want to relocate yourself, no matter whatever the compensation has been offered. So it's it's basically the forced and uh, uh, and also uh, uh, very very atrocious if we try to uh, put it brutally. So uh, a little bit about Kana National Park. Kana National Park is the oldest one and the first protected area. Mandala and Balaghats are two districts of Madhya Pradesh from where Kana National Park has been created by carving the uh, forest area out of it. So, and also Mandala is the home of largest tribal population uh, of the district, which accounts nearly 57 to 60% of total tribal population. And Balaghat accounts for 35% population as tribal. The region popularly was earlier known as Banjo Valley and is home of, traditionally is home of Bagas and Gon tribes, the indigenous people of Central Indian Forest. Banjo Valley displacement is one of the oldest registered case of conservation induced displacement in the history of independent India. Why I am saying in the history of independent India, because earlier before uh, India got independence, there have been many incidents, but they are uh, they are reported, but they are uh, never being acknowledged or nobody um, took care of them since uh, it was a colonial uh, kind of setup. Then princely states were also there and uh, they have this uh, free will and free way of hunting and uh, enjoying the forest resources and, and thereafter blaming the tribal people. So it was never registered. And therefore I'm saying after independence. Since then there are 25 dislocated villages which accounts for nearly 650 families. Interestingly, Madhya Pradesh in itself is a classic model of conservation where the state accounts for nine national parks, six tiger reserves and 25 wildlife sanctuaries. So this is my uh, study site, the village Kapot Behra. Village Kapot Behra is one of the oldest sites in Kana located in the buffer zone of the national park. It is eight kilometers away from the main gate, which is known as Khatia Gate of the national park. And it's a very uh, small village dominated by a uh, population of Baigars and Gons, especially. Baigars and Gon tribes are displaced from the, their traditional original villages inside the forest and uh, from the core of Kanan National. And with, with them, there are 19 such evictions that followed from 1975 to 1988 till 1989. The village consists of 42 Baga households and 39 Gond families. Uh, there is no clear-cut demarcation of village boundary because there is a continuity in the forest itself. Uh, 
there are nine households which are belonging to a caste community. Uh, so I have kept that sample out of my study, uh, of, at least for the purpose of this presentation, because that's another story of caste group dominance and how there are multiple uh, uh, events of violence against tribal communities. So it's 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 basically it's uh, it has multiple layers that how caste and tribal uh, how caste groups and tribal communities have been impacted by this this relocation separately. So the study is also based on the comparison between these two tribes because uh, Gonds uh, just uh, uh, I'm just giving you a very small introduction of, of Gonds that they are uh, even in the tribal paradigm they are the powerful tribes they are the land owning tribes and Bagas have been uh, working on uh, their field for a very very long period of time so uh, and and they both have been relocated since the inception of Kana National Park so there is a comparative study which I have done for Bagas and Gonds both. So these are some of the narratives from the field. Uh, we do not practice cultivation. It is like scratching our mother's skin. We lived in these forests and they are everything for us. So this is one of the uh, resource person from Baga community. And uh, this, all these uh, narratives came out from these different, different uh, people, elderly people who were earlier there inside the forest. And now they have the second generation who only knows the story that how it has been relocated, how violent it was, and uh, how they're deprived of everything together and whatever they got in compensation has never been sufficient. So this came out, out of a focus group discussion on Baga Chopal. Uh, to quote Jokuram, he was uh, the basically a uh, very senior member of uh, the very senior member of that village. He said, "We practice agriculture inside forest. There, the land was fertile. It was not rocky like this. The water source was near our settlement. We cultivated paddy in small lands, but but the crop was good and enough for our family and survival. We also had good pastures there." It was all green, abundant, and comfortable. We were happy. The land is not fertile. The land, this now this land is the land which they have got in return as a compensation. The land is not fertile and it requires a lot of strength to cultivate it. The crop is not sufficient for our own family. Due to this reason, we work as labor in Nagpur. Nagpur is a nearby city, which is like 200 kilometers from the site uh, from this village. So this is also... Uh, this this paragraph or this this ex excerpt this narrative is also a kind of example that how uh, how these uh, these communities are now turning into laborers earlier who were uh, maybe the owners or who were the uh, agriculturals or who were simply dependent on these forests now they are working as laborers in nearby cities and they are getting something which is very very marginal in lean period when uh, when there is no uh, construction work going on so so they are out of their job then they they simply have nothing to do so this is another kind of uh, this is another kind of alienation that they are feeling one that they are being displaced from their village and second that they have to move to the city in search of uh, in search of some kind of job if they can get something so what are what are the major findings? I just want to keep it very compact. Uh, I can see I have only 10 minutes left. Uh, Kapoor Behra was relocated in 1987-88. It is a tribal village dominated by these two communities. The early phase of displacement has witnessed disagreements from these two communities. And they were not ready to move anywhere from their ancestral land. That 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 inferences that this 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 relocation has not uh, you know uh, is not actually a kind of relocation which is uh, based on agreements uh, the, the disagreements are coming from people and and those and those things are not registered because there were massive killing of you know uh, these uh, uh, the the youngsters who who actually raised their voice against these uh, relocations Compensation and policy of rehabilitation has been explained to them whereby they are promised to be given job, alternative source of livelihood, which was not the case right now. The policy explained was to ensure them and reduce their dependency on forest as these tribal communities are totally dependent on these forests, especially the Baga community. There is no great difference that I got 
uh, uh, from the field survey that Bagas and Gon communities are living inside forests. They can be only differentiated in terms of their traditional livelihood practices. They both are forced into labor. The overall picture is dismal and standard of living is below poverty line. There is no permanent source of income and livelihood options are fragmented. The social and economic status of village is considered to be critical. The soil quality is of inferior in nature. This is basically about the land they, that they have got in compensation, nearly 2.5 acres of land they have got in compensation. The soil quality is inferior and generally uh, it generally comprises of basically sandy to loamy and it has very uh, little moisture and, and, and the climatic uh, condition of Central Indian forest for more than for seven to eight months, it, it, it remains semi-arid kind of uh, situation, the climate. Low moisture retaining capacity and which lacks micronutrients. So it is not very good for cropping and that land is just lying down there. There is a general dependency on rain for a good kharif production. The cropping pattern is also single except for that they grow some millets and uh, some coarse, uh, some coarse millets like their traditional millet is known as podo and kutki along with some vegetables in their homestead only. The water resources are scarce. The major source of water is river Banjar located on a barren site. The nearby source of water is within three kilometers of the radius, which is like three kilometers. There's a lot of distance if you have to go every day and carry water for your uh, basic, uh, you know, needs. Uh, even for drinking water, the women uh, they have to uh, go like approximately six kilometers every day. The rivulet is a distributary of Banjar River, which is polluted due to garbage disposal, washing, and domestic cleaning. Now, this garbage disposal, washing, and domestic cleaning is coming from the resorts which are being made, you know, in the buffer zone of Kana National Park. The rivulet is the only permanent source of drinking water for the people who are living in the village, Kapoor Behra. Sonali, sorry for the interruption. Uh, you're running out of time, so if you can conclude, that will be... Okay, okay. Thanks. All right, all right. Uh, can I... I have five minutes or two minutes? Five minutes, maybe? Uh, two minutes. You are... You're past 20, but yeah, a couple of minutes, maybe one, if possible, thanks. Okay, okay. All right, so this table is showing basic livelihood sources and the dependency. And we can see the dependency of these different, different livelihood options. This is the income, and uh, this is the percentage of dependency. These are my observation. They are migrating barren land. There is absent diversification. There is a reduction in fat content. There is no poultry. NDF because NT, NTFP is uh, basically non-timber fiber, produ uh, fiber produce, which is being restricted for the usage now. So they cannot dependent on that. They cannot collect their firewood, which is nil. And uh, there is a local liquor, which is very popular in the region, which was the production uh, that they do from forest. It is also nil. However, they are now being addicted to that uh, since uh, they have lost a sense of belongingness to the place. Uh, these are some potential impact and losses uh, from 1973 to 2020. So we can see that uh, biodiversity loss, wildlife and uh, uh, agro, agro, agriculture and forest has been lost there, food insecurity and crop damage. These are the categories that I have covered for. There is a shift that I tried to notice for these 30 years. So uh, just to conclude, uh, there is a need to understand or to deconstruct the conservation model because it has been appropriated for uh, reproducing the uh, extractive spaces and it has been now uh, been appropriated since uh, the creation of these national parks, especially in India. Uh, there should be a balance sheet for this conservation, who is losing what and who is gaining what. And conservation without displacement, alternative models and approaches, if we can, community-based model or co-management approach. So, uh, so, so that's what I have to say because I think I'm running out of time. So I think, thank you. So here Very I stop. Much, so yeah. Sonali, yes. sorry we had to stop you, yeah. <laughs> but no we have to to host three three presenters and to have a rich yeah. discussion. I think thank you very much. 
you, I mean, you mentioned the sanctuaries, nat natural sanctuaries, and I think it's very interesting this importance of religious lexicon. Uh, we mentioned with um, uh, Mariana uh, the sacrifice and now the sanctuary. So thank you very much, Tilde. I will keep my comment short. Uh, this is a student conference and uh, I have not much to say. I think when I worked on these issues uh, 40 years ago, and a little bit more, uh, I was not equipped, as you are now, with this conceptual apparatus that is uh, extremely sophisticated. And uh, we were doing some bricolage, I would say, not in the levi straussian sense, but uh, we did not know how to deal with this uh, idea of conservation. So uh, you have seen, okay, but I read the, the paper beforehand, so I know everything. Uh, uh, sacrifice, sanctuary, and now uh, for Louisiana, at, 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 at least, paradise, paradise for sportsmen. So again, this uh, religious short lexic lexicon that has accompanied us during this uh, great hour for me. So I have three questions for the presenters and uh, for uh, uh, the, the, the listeners to, uh, um, as a transition from the, the first panel and the, and, and the keynote to uh, uh, our panel. So the first one is uh, very naive. What would be a full-fledged critical view of conservation if we, at least you are, not satisfied, but I'm not satisfied either, with this extractive dimension of conservation? Okay, so going beyond uh, what uh, uh, I think Mariana said about the critical scholars are denouncing, that we are very good at, and uh, proposing, I mean, alternatives, okay, to uh, overcome the TINA that came back, even with the, the green mining. Second question in his keynote this morning, Sandro said, if I'm not mistaken, green mining is not entirely greenwashing. And this is a very interesting idea that we should discuss in, in regard of what was uh, uh, said this afternoon, because it's a key point, I think. Third point, because of course we saw, and very interestingly, uh, the emergence of social movements, particularly in the first presentation, but this is a key question, of course, uh, because the question of Nature, nature, environment, uh, whatever uh, uh, we, we call it, environment, I don't know, uh, Anthropocene and so on. So is a, a, a beautiful example of multiple scales and the multiscalar approach that was already present this morning. So, uh, of course, we are dealing with the local and the global. And the local, of course, we had three uh, um, case studies, very, very inspiring, where the indigenous people or the local people have been sort of sacralized, okay? And of course, we need more than the indigenous people to fight against what we believe is not a good thing for us and for the earth. As you are writing monographs about extremely interesting cases, what would be the case, I would say, for what Bruno Latour calls Gaia, the Earth, as the only place where we inhabit. And I know that one of the most brilliant uh, um, philosophers and, and scholars of, uh, um, I mean, environment, nature, in a neo-Marxist uh, um, uh, direction, Andreas Mount say, uh, less Latour and more Lenin. Okay, so would you agree with Andreas? Or uh, uh, would you say neither Latour nor Lenin? Or Latour plus Lenin? Sorry, I'm not clear uh, myself about what I think about it. But of course, we have all these struggles. And maybe for the first time in human history, the possibility for a real universalism, because of course, we have only one planet. So I will stop here. I think, of course, with the permission of organizers, we can uh, go on uh, until 4.15, hmm? if, you, if you agree. Okay, so I, I call Tilda now. I think we have to 
I'm sorry. Uh, it's a little bit strange, okay? <laughs> yes, I am sorry about it, but it's uh, we have also to. I mean, show a little bit of with you, no? <laughs> okay. Well, if you imagine we, we we don't have we. Of course, we are claiming for low tech. The growth. What can you bring holograms? No, on the chairs. Okay, so I mean the discussion has started. So who would like to start? Unless one of you want to comment on the others for two minutes. No. Mariana, Mariana Arsonari, if you want to jump in, just jump in. Yeah, it's is it okay? Not yet. Not, Not yet? Yes, I'm sorry. It's not for Yes, it's very complex. <laughs> I, did, I didn't see any change. Uh, you need to get yeah, okay, okay. Now, now they can. Okay. Yeah, ah, that's it. <laughs> okay. So it's not technical, it's just I'm awkward with the uh, microphones. <laughs> You know, I belong uh, to a generation where there were no mics uh, before the <laughs> before the record and so on. Okay, so uh, the floor is yours. This way. Yeah, can we? Uh, I don't know if we can, you can hear me. Yes, we can. Yeah, I don't know very well how the how you how you want the format to be. I don't know if there's going to be another. Or if we can like intervene or? Yes, we can intervene. Okay, yeah. Yeah, I mean, um, so thank you so much. I think these were like great questions. And when you were, uh, yeah, you were talking about critical scholars, we like to criticize, denounce a lot, but then uh, often the criticism that we are met with or, or the backfire is that we don't have real alternatives to, to propose. And um, unfortunately, I couldn't be here this morning because I was doing physiotherapy for my knee. <laughs> so I couldn't listen to Sandro Medraza's uh, keynote talk. But um, when I think, think about alternatives to this, what we call green extractivism or, um, or at least the, or to the current energy transition, I immediately think about proposals such as degrowth or proposals such as commoning. And I really think that these have to be structural uh, alternatives. We cannot be thinking, okay, let's replace. What, what I believe that the critical scholars are denouncing is the fact that we are now replacing, let's say, gas and oil uh, with lithium or other, other raw materials, rather than shifting completely what is um, the structure of how we conceive energy, how we produce energy, how we consume energy. And uh, there's a lot of work that has been done on uh, explaining how, for example, if we, instead of substituting the whole um, amount of electric individual electric vehicles that we now have, I mean, individual vehicles that we now have for electric vehicles, which are the estimations that the European Commission does, they literally want to replace every single car by an electric car, rather than electrifying the mobility through public, um, public common and shared uh, transportation, this would drastically reduce our need for uh, these uh, energy raw materials. So first of all, if we I really think this have, has to be a, at a structural level understanding that uh, in our cities, we shouldn't be needing an individual car, each, each one. We should be, it should be possible to rely on a good uh, electrified mobility circuit, public mobility circuit. Uh, we should be investing on bikes, blah, blah. So this only to talk about the transportation uh, mobility, which is the one that is now being accelerated. But even at the energy, uh, which is obviously linked with the energy transition, but even at the energy transition, some other uh, reports have been done. And for example, there's this report called Green Mining is a Myth, which was done by the environmental, uh, European Environmental Bureau and Friends of the Earth Europe. And they have really calculated, you know, like the amount of um, minerals that we have already extracted and the amounts of minerals that the European Commission deems that we need to extract 
And what if we changed it? What if we didn't replace all the individual cars? What if there was electric mobility? What if to create new wind turbines and solar panels, instead of dispossessing rural livelihood, we were using you know, dumpster sites or like already sacrificed zones? Obviously this also poses questions, but um, so there are some alternatives, but I, I, I mean, there are some alternatives to this very specific um, logistical questions, but I think mainly what we should be talking about is really a structural uh, alternative. We should, I mean, Europe should be talking about ecological reparations and it, sh it shouldn't be internalizing the, what the cost of extraction that it has always externalized, right, to the global south and now it's internalizing to the periphery of Europe. Um, it, it should be rethinking. Uh, there's other ways, that, other patterns, other structures of of consuming, of producing, of relating to nature, of relating to one another. Uh, and so this is why I think, yeah, proposals like degrowth, like commoning, like are, are, are very interesting in, um, in allowing us to think with uh, all, these, all these questions, but this, I don't wanna take more space, but I can interview later for other, the other questions that I thought were very, very interesting, but I'll, I'll also leave the other <laughs> speakers to say something. <laughs> okay, I'm convinced. Thank you very much. Viswesh? There's some question from the floor, just so you know what's happening. Yeah. Um, my question is to Sonali. Uh, thank you, Sonali, for your presentation. And um, it's nice to see uh, the question of conservation in India coming back. But I found it a little curious that you never mentioned the Maoists at all in your presentation, because even recently I read a work that there is Maoist activity in, in Kanha. I mean, not that whether it's actually there or not, but just the rhetoric of the Maoists is interesting because what we're then going to see now is that perhaps it's going to be a mixture of conservation and securitization that's going to be used. And Madhya Pradesh is obviously notorious for that. Uh, so they might just say that, you know, uh, they, we need to displace tribals from these areas because there is Maoist activity here. And, you know, the indigenous groups obviously fall prey to the Maoists and the whole rhetoric is going to repeat itself. So I was just wondering if you also saw this in your fieldwork in, in Kanha, because I think it's, of course, Kanha is very big, obviously, but I don't know if it was in your area as well where this thing started. And I just wanted to know if you want to comment a little bit on this mixture of uh, conservation and securitization and whether uh, securitization might just be used as a as a sort of the other side of the coin instead of conservation to uh, further displacement and uh, further, you know, marginalize these indigenous groups in that sense. Okay. So, uh, yeah, actually... Uh, uh, sorry, uh, sorry, Sonali. W would it be okay if we take some couple of questions and then you respond um, so, to the them? So Absolutely. that... Okay. There were... Okay. Uh, just, just one here. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so, is it for Tilda? Yeah. Um, I wanted to ask if you could uh, maybe get into more detail about the racial, uh, the racial aspect of um, the problems that you uh, spoke about in your in your presentation. Thank you. So I. Thank you so much uh, to, to all the three. I have a question. Um, um, I have a, I have a question um, to Mariana, and it's about the uh, part of social engineering um, for the project in in Portugal. And I was just curious. Um, I've read about other mining projects, and I've seen in my own fieldwork that sometimes this um, community relations vocabulary that uh, mining companies use in the relations where they people local community and themselves a company that this vocabulary gets adopted also uh, by the people who live around the mine and who face the mine that these categories and ways of constructing the relation the mining companies manage to impose in a way as the common of lingua franca of dealing with these questions so i was just wondering in your in the engineering of consent in your case if you saw any of that and what it might have looked like thank you um, I have one question. Um, actually, it's both the Mariana and uh, Sonali as well. Uh, also, to the, the, I mean, it's a kind of a general question because we uh, we talked uh, this morning about the mining and the certain expectations in the Gustav's case that the people actually wanted 
uh, certain lands to be mined. And in, uh, there is this, um, uh, the aspect that I see here is that the, um, when Mariana talked about the green Tina, uh, can we see a more uh, genealogical approach to Tina, the evolving of the Tina from the neoliberalism and the precarities that it created? And what can be the uh, today's expectations of the community on in terms of development? And um, as well in the Sonali's case, there were certain affects or certain kind of uh, affectual interpretations of the nature and how it interprets into certain expectations and aspirations of development by the completion of these uh, extractive processes. So that was my question. Okay, you you may now uh, respond. Sonali? Yeah, okay. Uh, so the first question about uh, uh, Maoism. Uh, actually, uh, you are absolutely right when you said that there have been stories and I have not included that in my presentation. So it is not the case actually, because it's a huge, um, I am winding up my PhD work. So there is a, a dedicated segment where I have talked about uh, these activities. Rather, uh, I, I, we can use the word actually Naxalite or Naxalite movement or, or you know, uh, uh, Naxalism, which is a popular term uh, in the context of Madhya Pradesh. Uh, since Kana National Park is a huge area, and uh, uh, as I mentioned in my presentation that I have surveyed the villages which are situated on the uh, other side of the Madhya Pradesh, which is Mandala and Balaghat. Uh, if we look at Madhya Pradesh clearly, Madhya Pradesh is its, its political boundary with Chhattisgarh. Between Madhya Pradesh and Chhattisgarh, there is, a, there is this corridor which is also known as Red Corridor because of the Naxalite movement or Naxalite activities. and it was not advisable for me to venture there because I uh, I, I surveyed like uh, there with you know a bunch of uh, researchers and uh, it was actually very difficult for me to venture towards that side of the gate which is another gate which is known as Mukki Gate and I surveyed from uh, the side which was little less uh, uh, what should I say dense so that I can go inside and uh, do my work. So I would, uh, I cannot comment on the present situation uh, as a researcher who has been to the field because I have not been to that side. It's a huge, huge national park. But yes, uh, the rhetoric that uh, you mentioned about, uh, uh, you know, uh, taming the naturalism and therefore uh, dislocating people from the forest in the name of, uh, you know, uh, from the name, uh, in the name of basically threats to internal security of a country or of a state or something, it is very much there. It is not rhetoric, actually, it is, uh, it has made one of the reasons that why uh, this massive displacements have happened. And uh, in the in the in the similar vein, I have mentioned that in my uh, uh, you know PhD. In the similar vein, the next question that comes on uh, racial aspect. So I uh, I am not giving a general answer. I am giving a very very specific answer to this question. Uh, the term naxalism or uh, the kind of rhetoric that has uh, that has been created. Uh, for uh, for the tribal communities is something which is the, which is uh, actually embedded in the social fabric of uh, Indian subcontinent. Uh, the uh, we uh, we see uh, you know uh, by by we I mean I mean to see the kind of social hierarchies that we uh, live in uh, in Indian continent and the larger uh, region of Indian subcontinent is basically divided into caste groups and tribal communities. Now. Uh, in that continuum of caste and tribes, tribes have always been marginalized. There is a, a racial uh, undertone always till date. It is there. And so much so that uh, that's what I said that coincidentally, Madhya Pradesh, where there are a series of these protected areas have been created. Uh, it is the area which is largely dominated by tribal communities. It is very easy to displace them in the name of development, in the name of some kind of uh, you know a protection of uh, in environment like conservation that we that i am working on but we have 
several examples of uh, you know uh, where uh, there is extraction of minerals where we have uh, the uh, crea creation of kind of chains of small and big dams on 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 narmada valley which is very popular narmada bachao andolan and that has also displaced like million of people so there is a racial undertone and it has always been there and they are the easiest one to displace because they lack uh, you know a voice and uh, they are already marginalized this is their and in india largely these tribes of central india it is only their first generation which has ventured into uh, primary education uh, so uh, so 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 they are further marginalized uh, by this kind of uh, uh, segmentation with this kind of displacement in the name of development so this that that racial undertone is there yes and uh, then uh there is one question that i am missing i think i have answered that with racial aspect the question of development as as well i think if that satisfies one thing one thing one, one more thing that i would like to comment or add to uh, to what i said about a uh, development uh i am i am also uh, a law graduate so my my perception when i try uh, when i'm trying to understand that why madhya pradesh especially is an interesting space uh, in terms of this uh, um, fragmentation and this kind of uh, you know uh, um, uh, what should i say discrimination against uh, tribal community especially uh, the laws are not clear the laws of the land are not clear i have looked into those documents there is no continuity uh at one at some places they are talking the laws are talking about you know compensation and and at certain places they are talking about a uh, wildlife poaching and therefore referring to these tribal communities as criminal communities uh, but historically if we look into the history of these places we we can see that these were the favorite grounds of you know uh, shikar hunting by princely states and the colonial uh, you know rulers and the, the amount of uh, uh, the the amount of uh, uh, wildlife killings and poaching that have been happened uh, in those times is much more that what we are experiencing or what we have seen uh, you know now after the independence so laws are already um, there are many multiple gaps in the land laws of that particular uh, area so it is very difficult for tribal people to uh, claim their stakes and to show some kind of uh, you know uh prove for something so that they have a voice and therefore it is very easy to twist them it is very easy to displace them and uh, that's how uh, it is continuing till date yeah thank you mariana yes sorry my internet went off for a brief second there but um yeah thank you for your questions i noted down at least two um the first one about the social engineering and yeah like this good re good relations with the community vocabulary that it's really textbook of mine of the mining industry and that sometimes gets adopted by the local communities which it indeed in some cases and it really develops into how what are the perceptions and expectations of development and progress that are um that are obviously context sensitive and in this case um this is still like a recent a relatively recent conflict and relatively low intensity conflict uh so this vocabulary has still not been co-opted by the community the community is a very small one there's like in this specific village less than 300 inhabitants but then in the bahosa region there's 22 mining projects that i will also be looking into uh and obviously the population is much, much higher but definitely this this good relations vocabulary was not co-opted by the local communities because they still firmly reject uh these mining projects uh although obviously the local powers the local authorities uh do uh co-opt this discourse and this narrative and they're like yes uh the company is so nice they have been doing this this and that uh and they have also promised this to the municipality so there's also like capital agreements that are made between the municipalities or the town halls with the mining company um but uh, or for example the company has also employed very key influential rich people um so these are very rare there's like 
two people who are employed by the mining company, but, and I've talked to them and it's out of their free will. Uh, and these are obviously people who have this rhetoric of, okay, I want to make more money. Um, this is, uh, I am not a farmer. I, I don't want to be a farmer. So this is a good opportunity. So in those cases, yes, this narrative is co-opted, but in general for the, for the population, not. And for, to answer the second question about the genealogy of, of Tina and, um, and yes, and, to, and precisely about this idea of what are the expectations, uh, you know, this idea of there's no alternative rather than opening large open pit mines and destroy the mountains and ex produce uh, lithium, refine lithium for uh, producing batteries. Um, is really, really deconstructed by the local the locals of this region because truly this is an agricultural village. There is no problems of unemployment. People are farmers, except for these very rare people who, yes, they're not farmers and they don't want to be farmers and they also don't want to immigrate and they see in the mining company an opportunity. The large, the vast majority of people are farmers uh, or they're very old and they have been farmers and they still keep working their own land. But they really reject this idea of development that the mining company would, would might bring. And what is interesting to see is that even the company here itself, at first they started off by saying and by saying that they would promote six, they would create six hundred jobs. But now they're already saying that it's only one hundred fifty jobs. Out of each, the majority, it's only indirect jobs. So they have also changed their narrative. And what is interesting for me in this case is that the Portuguese government does not portray this at all as an opportunity for these communities. It's a bit like Sonali was saying, these are communities which are incredibly vulnerable, incredibly left out by the central government. They have no access to schools, hospitals, uh, basic services at all. Um, and really the government portrait, this idea of sacrifice zones is also present in the discourse of the government. They say that these are uh, ignorant farmers, they're all, either they're ignorant farmers or they're old. So they don't even, the expectations of development are not even projected by the government to the populations, they're projected by the government to the country. They say Portugal will be leading this battery value chain. Portugal will be accumulating capital, will be bringing out capital, blah, blah, blah. Like, this is the discourse. It's not about the people. So the people are really seen as disposable for the sake of capital accumulation, for the sake of positioning Portugal um, in, in this position of leadership. So in this case, yes, this rhetoric of progress or industrialization or modernization is really not, I mean, the, the populations are really targeted as, you know, they're disposable, we can govern them because they're either going to die or they're just ignorant farmers. And this is really a rhetoric that the Secretary of State has has used to to, to nominate these, these populations who are struggling and who are fighting for for for, the, for nature and for their livelihoods. So, yeah. I hope I, 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 I think so I, I had these two questions, I think, I hope I answered, yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much. What should we do now, dear organizers? Hmm? It's too early to conclude, I think. Uh, it was a very rich discussion. Thank you for your energy, uh, the three of you. It was great. Uh, thank you again, dear organizers, for this occasion to refresh our ideas on conservation and move forward. Thank you.